Hello, welcome. Hi. Happy, happy Monday. Happy March. I can't believe it's March. Before you know it, the spring will be here. Everybody's coming on in. If you would just type your first name or your nickname for me in the chat. I would appreciate that. Thank you very much. Yeah, I almost forgot that there are only 28 days in February and I almost forgot to pay my bills. <laughs> And then I looked at the calendar and I was like, oh, <laughs> it's the first. <laughs> I am definitely looking forward to, I actually, I'm one of those weird people who really enjoys the winter. I, I love all of our seasons and, um, but I am definitely looking forward to spring this year. Um, if for no other reason than to get outside more. <laughs> um, the isolation of, of the pandemic has, has worn me down. I need some pretty spring flowers and, and nice uh, walks in, in warm weather. All right, it looks like, I think we're waiting for one more person. So um, today we're going to be talking about ultraviolet light and how we use ultraviolet light to control the growth of microbes. Um, it's a very commonly used tool that we have at our disposal um, to control the microbes that might be growing in the environment around us. So that's what our um, exercise will be about today. And then later in the week, when we get together, we're going to be talking about controlling the growth of microbes with chemicals, the kinds of chemicals that we use as um, sanitizers and disinfectants and things like that. So um, so no exams or anything this week. You do have um, two lecture topics, two quizzes, um, uh, a typical schedule for the week. Um, all right, I did want to share something with you just in case you missed it on Canvas. If I can pull this up for us. Just um, something for fun that I posted up on Canvas for us. Hopefully you're seeing our homepage, our Canvas homepage. Um, what I'm doing is going over here to the menu and I'm clicking on discussions. And if you go into the discussions area and you click on the questions board and then scroll down, um, you'll find a post that I put up um, about auger art. <laughs> Just something oh. fun. Um, I think I mentioned to you the last time we were together that um, that people make these um, just as sort of you know something fun to do in the laboratory, and it has become um, a competition each year. Um, uh, both here in our country and around the world. Um, and of course, what what technicians and uh, microbiologists are doing is using uh, bacteria and fungi and other microbes and sort of painting them onto various types of auger plates in a way that uh, when the cells grow, they create these images, they create these pictures. So this is all bacteria and fungi and other microbes growing on auger. And it's just the reason you get the image is because someone has painted the cells on painstakingly um, to produce um, something that we recognize. Um, some of these microbes are capable of fluorescence. Some of the microbes that um, have been genetically modified can create fluorescence. So you can get images like this created. But um, as you can see, some of these folks are very talented. Um, not just as scientists, but as um, 
as microbiologists, they know um, the colors um, that certain organisms grow on agar and the texture that they grow in and so on. Um, it's really quite remarkable what you can do. Um, so completely unrelated to what we're talking about today, but um, if you're interested, uh, that is a yearly competition. And if you go onto the um, American Society of Microbiologists website, um, they post all of the previous winners and some of the best artwork that people have created in the laboratory, which is kind of fun, something different. All right, so um, first things first, does anybody have any questions about anything? Anything that they've been uh, watching or reading? Um, anything that's been on assignments? I had a question um, about, and I might just completely be missing it on YouTube, but yeah. the antimicrobial uh, lecture that's for Thursday. Yeah. I don't see it posted. Oh, oh, let me check on that. Thank you. That's the same question. I emailed you. Okay. I may have, um, I may not, I may have forgotten to put it into our playlist. I'll take care of that. Thank you for letting me know. And I was also wondering if um, before spring break, if you'd post the ones for the following week. Oh yeah, I'd be happy to. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Okay. Yeah, I can take care of that. No problem. I imagine that's what I probably did. Um, oh, it, it does take uh, when you when you upload things onto YouTube. Um, it's it's a really easy to use system, but it does take a while for the videos to process when they get up there before they're available to you to make any kind of modifications to or anything like that. So what sometimes happens is I'll upload things and while I'm waiting for them to process so I can move them into our playlist, I get distracted and start doing something else. And then I forget to put them into the playlist. So uh, thank you for letting me know. No problem, I can relate to that. <laughs> <laughs> distracted. Do we, have a, do we have a quiz for Thursday? So I didn't um, see one on the list. Hold on, let me pull up our schedule here. So we can take a look, all of us together. This is just, uh, this is the syllabus that's in our, um, this is the schedule that's in our syllabus, excuse me. Um, so um, I've just got, I've just scrolled down to the end and we're uh, here now, the, this week of March 1st. So you should have two quizzes. You should have um, a quiz, sorry, a quiz that's about the control of microbial growth and a quiz about the antimicrobials. Now, I just worked on the antimicrobials quiz today. So if you looked for it before today, you may not have seen it. Um, but again, I'll double check and make sure everything is up and published and your videos are available to you after class. So yes, there are two quizzes and um, lab questions this week. Now looking ahead to next week, you have your second um, lab practical exam and you have your next lecture exam. So it's a very strange week for us this week of March 8th. We don't have, you, you don't have lecture material to watch on YouTube. You don't have quizzes to take or anything like that. It's purely about um, examinations next week. So we'll have the lab practical exam on Monday. And again, you'll be able to take it at any point in the day on Monday. And we'll have the lecture exam on Wednesday. So what that means is um, we won't be meeting to do any laboratory work. Um, now, if you... Um, need to meet with me during the week, next week, because you're having a problem or because you don't understand something um, and you wanna talk about it, we can certainly meet over Zoom, but we won't have uh, any formal laboratory meetings next week. Um, that will actually take us all the way up to spring break. 
and again, uh, as we said a minute ago, I will go ahead and make sure before spring break that the following week's lecture material is posted for you. So if you would like to uh, get a jump on that during spring break, you may. And no lab uh, classes next week? Say again? No lab next week? That's right. The week of the eighth, next week, there's no lab. So we won't be meeting over Zoom. You'll have a, an exam to take on Monday that's about lecture material, oh, sorry, about lab material. And then you'll have an exam to take on Wednesday that's about lab material, uh, lecture material. <laughs> oh, I can't speak today. I apologize. Yeah, let me pull it up again for you so you can see. And remember the way these exams work. So this second lab practical, which will take place on Monday, March 8th, this will cover the laboratory material since the last lab practical. So it starts with the microbes in the environment uh, lab, and it includes the fungi, special media, oxygen and growth, and what we do this week. Those things will be um, on that lab practical exam. And then in terms of the lecture exam, which will be on Wednesday next week, it'll, be, it'll begin with the biochemistry material, the microbial growth, the control of growth, and the antimicrobials. And both the lab practical and the lecture exam will look very similar to the other ones you've seen. So um, very typical um, length, nothing new there, um, and a similar format for the questions. All right. Any questions about our schedule or um, anything that you've been viewing or? All right, very good. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and pull up our slides. Bear with me for just a minute. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and share this screen with you. So we've been talking a lot so far in the course about how we grow microbes, how we purposefully grow microbes in the lab and how we handle them and how we transfer them from container to container and how we can put them in the incubator and we can get colonies to form, all of these things that we're doing to purposefully grow microbes. We've also talked about how we can take samples from the environment around us, and bring them into the lab, and then again, culture them on purpose to get them to grow. But this week, we're really talking about how we control growth, in other words, what do we do when we have microbes and we don't want them there? And of course, there are two very different situations when it comes to needing to control the growth of microbes. The first situation is controlling them in the environment around us. And that's really what we're talking about today. And the other situation is how do we control them when they're growing abnormally in our bodies? And that's really the um, antimicrobial material. So we've developed all kinds of chemicals that we use um, to control microbes. We'll be talking about those on Wednesday. But um, one of the sort of physical methods that we use to control microbes is ultraviolet light. Uh, we've known that the sun is uh, damaging to the growth of bacteria and other microbes for many, many, many years. Um, it's something that has been used historically as a disinfectant. People have used sunlight to disinfect surfaces and, and uh, materials. So what we're gonna talk about today is what, first of all, what ultraviolet light is and what it's doing to bacteria specifically. 
that um, prevents them from growing in an uncontrolled way in our environment. So our objectives today are first to just talk about ultraviolet light and what it is. Then we're gonna talk about the effects of ultraviolet light on bacteria. And there are really two key things that UV does to bacterial cells. It can damage them and specifically it damages their DNA and it can also kill them outright depending on how much ultraviolet they're exposed to. We're gonna talk about the mechanism of action of ultraviolet. In other words, what exactly is it doing to the DNA molecule inside bacteria that damages it? We'll talk about how DNA damage can lead to um, this process called mutation. And then we'll also talk about how bacterial cells and other living cells have the ability to repair a certain amount of damage to their DNA. Now, humans also have repair mechanisms in their cells. So when our cells get damaged, when their DNA gets damaged, there are certain repair mechanisms that exist in our cells. The Repair mechanisms that exist in bacteria overlap with ours a little bit, but then there are other mechanisms in bacteria that we don't have. So for example, bacteria have a repair system called photoreactivation. This is also um, sort of um, referred to sometimes casually as light repair. And they have another system called excision repair or dark repair as it's sometimes called. Um, again, similar to what humans have, but a little bit different in bacteria. So let's start off by talking a little bit about what, we're, what we mean when we use this word ultraviolet light or we talk about ultraviolet light. We need to remind ourselves of what is known in physics as the electromagnetic radiation spectrum. And that's what you're looking at on this slide. So when we talk about things like visible light or ultraviolet light or radio waves or gamma rays, all of those things are forms of electromagnetic radiation. We don't think about the light around us as radiation, but that's exactly what it is. And all of the different forms of electromagnetic radiation in the natural world can be placed into a spectrum of strength or a spectrum of energy by their wavelengths. Now, again, this gets into some physics and I don't wanna to go too deep here, but if you remember from a physics class you may have taken in the past, light is unusual because it has two properties associated with it. It behaves as both a wave and a particle. It's the dual nature or the duality of light. And all of these forms of electromagnetic radiation therefore have a wavelength associated with them. Um, because this, again, this uh, physical um, form of radiation is traveling as both a wave and a particle. When we talk about visible light, so this is the light that you and I are capable of seeing. Light ranges, of course, from um, a purplish color all the way up through the other colors we associate with um, living things to a red at the higher end. And the wavelengths are in the area of 400 to 700 nanometers. In other words, the distance from the peak or the, um, uh, the trough, so the top or the bottom of a wave to the next. So the peak of one wave to the peak of the next wave or the trough, the bottom of one wave to the bottom of the next wave, that distance can be measured. 
And for visible light, that wavelength is 400 to 700 nanometers. Now, if you start to go on the spectrum off to the left, the wavelengths get longer and longer and longer. If you go off from visible light to the right here, sorry, this is to the left. Um, if you go off in this direction <laughs> to ultraviolet, to X-rays, to gamma rays, now the wavelength is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. Now, what does it mean? Well, it means that when we get down to this end of the spectrum where the wavelengths are very long, the energy that is in that form of electromagnetic radiation is, is low. When you get over on the other side, where the wavelengths are very, very short, the energy goes way up. So there's energy associated with this. And, and with energy comes the ability to damage living things. So of course, you know, if we look down here and we talk about AM radio waves or the radio that gives us our television or FM radio, we're talking about wavelengths that are so low in energy that they don't harm us. They're not able to penetrate into our body or anything like that. They're not able to damage our cells. The same is true of radar waves, infrared, and visible light. Now, once you get up past visible light and you hit ultraviolet, remember the energy is going up as we go off in this direction to the left. Now you're talking about wavelengths that are so short that now we're getting into energies that are high enough to cause some damage to living tissue. So from visible length all the way down in this direction, there's nothing here that can harm us. From visible, um, above visible, we have energy, energetic forms that can harm us. And of course, the first one we bump into is ultraviolet. We get exposed to ultraviolet light every time we go outside because um, part of the electromagnetic radiation that comes from the sun is ultraviolet. So we get all of the wavelengths of visible light from our sun, and we also get ultraviolet rays from our sun. And that's why, as, as you all know, sunlight can damage us. Sunlight can harm us. It can damage our skin. And if you get enough damage to your skin from ultraviolet exposure, you can also develop cancers. Um, ultraviolet light can also damage your cornea. And if you get enough damage to your cornea over time from ultraviolet light, you could develop cataracts and your um, your cornea are basically um, opaque. You can't see through them anymore. So we've known again for a long time that ultraviolet light has enough energy in it to actually affect living cells. And we have made use of that fact in the control of bacteria. Now, the energy that's in X-rays and gamma rays, this energy is high enough that it can not only damage cells, but it can literally mutate our DNA. This is what we refer to as ionizing radiation. When you get hit with X-rays and you get, uh, or hit with gamma rays, and of course, gamma rays are coming from uh, nuclear type sources. Um, these wavelengths are so short and so powerful that they can literally knock electrons out of orbit in the molecules that are in your cells. They can penetrate all the way through your body and literally knock electrons out of the valence shell that surrounds every atom in your body. And they can create these very dangerous little atoms called free radicals. And free radicals 
can then go on to damage other molecules in your cells, including your DNA. So as you, I'm sure you know, um, people who get exposed to gamma rays through uh, nuclear accidents and um, through the couple of nuclear bombs um, that have been dropped during wartime, we know that some people actually die from this exposure. Other people have so much damage to their DNA that they develop cancers and so on. Um, Ultraviolet is different. Ultraviolet, while it is powerful enough to penetrate cells, it has very poor penetration compared to these other energetic forms like X-rays and gamma rays. Ultraviolet, in fact, can only penetrate to a depth of about two millimeters, believe it or not. So when you go out into the sun and you get exposed to ultraviolet light, what is most at risk on your body are the outer two millimeters of your skin and your eyes and so on. Ultraviolet cannot penetrate all the way into your liver or to your intestine or to any of your other organs. It just doesn't have enough strength to do that. X-rays, gamma rays can, they can penetrate all the way through your body. But ultraviolet, no, ultraviolet um, is not ionizing radiation. It's a different form of radiation. So I put this slide on here again, this one's actually oriented in the other direction than the one you just looked at. But I liked the image here of the long wavelength on this end of the scale, radio waves and microwaves and so on, and the very short wavelength on this end of the scale, gamma rays and X-rays and so on. Long wavelength means low energy. Short wavelength means high energy. All across the spectrum of electromagnetic radiation, so ultraviolet light, or what we more technically would refer to as ultraviolet radiation is non-ionizing. It's not gonna knock electrons out of orbit in your cells, but it still damages your cells. And we'll talk about how it does that. I now, have a question. Um, ultraviolet rays um, are, Shorter wavelength than visible? Yes. Okay, because the two, I'm, maybe I'm looking at it wrong, those two, the second um, wavelength thing. It has it on the other side, I think. Yeah, it's just turned around. I apologize okay. for that. It's a little confusing. If you look at this first image, the shortest wavelength is over here on the left. The longest wavelength is over here on the right. So gamma rays have a wavelength of about 10 to the minus 14th meter, whereas AM radio waves have a wavelength of about 10 to the fourth meter. So that's oriented this way. And then if you go to this one, it's flipped. Gamma rays are over on this side. Radio waves are over on this side. You see that? So. Um, Ultraviolet falls between visible light and the gamma rays. So it's on the high energy side, the, the short wavelength high energy side. And then microwaves, radio waves. Got you. On those I, I was just looking at it yeah, it's a, I'm like, wait. It's a okay. little confusing, <laughs> I know. Thank you. So let's talk about the, the actual wavelengths because it turns out that Ultraviolet radiation has a wide range of wavelengths associated with it. Remember we said in visible light, it can go from purple blue, which is about 400 nanometers, all the way to red, which is 700 nanometers. Well, when you go into the ultraviolet range, it goes all the way from about 15 nanometers up to 400 again. 400 would be where we start into the visible range. 
So there's a really big range of wavelengths in ultraviolet. In the 15 to 200 nanometer range. So these are the shortest wavelengths of ultraviolet light, the most energetic. You would think they're the most damaging, right? These actually get absorbed by molecules that are in our air, in our atmosphere. They don't even typically hit the ground, which is actually good for you and I, because they are the most energetic rays, the most potentially damaging rays. The rest of the range from 200 up to 400 does reach the ground. And we divide it into three kinds of ultraviolet because it has different effects. So in other words, there are some ultraviolet waves or rays as we call them that fall between 200 and 290 nanometers. Again, pretty short wavelength, pretty short wavelength. This is what we call UVC. And these wavelengths are biocidal. They kill living organisms. The optimal absorption of DNA, of I should say of ultraviolet light by DNA is in this range. So DNA best absorbs ultraviolet light in this range. So these wavelengths create the most damage to our DNA and are most likely to kill cells. Now I have a reference to a figure here. You can go ahead and ignore this since we're not using um, a lab, a written lab manual this semester. Next, the next type of UV that we see runs between 290, the upper range of UVC, all the way up to 320. So the wavelength is getting longer, little less energetic. This is what we call UVB radiation. It can also damage DNA. It's just not nearly as damaging as UVC is. I also have a note down here that at 300 nanometers, so again, UVB spectrum, at 300 nanometers, our cells actually need a little ultraviolet, right? or they can benefit from a little ultraviolet because the energy at that wavelength is what's needed to convert vitamin D1 to vitamin D3, which is the active form of vitamin D. So our skin cells, because remember ultraviolet is only affecting the outer layers of our body. Our skin cells actually get hit with ultraviolet rays at 300 nanometers and we get some vitamin D3 made, which is good. Finally, there's the UVA range, uh, rays. These range from 320 nanometers to 400 nanometers. UVA is not readily absorbed by DNA. The wavelength is just too high. So UVA rays don't tend to affect, to damage our DNA. That doesn't mean that they're safe though. UVA rays can still cause some changes in our skin. It's just that this is not the kind of ultraviolet that's damaging our DNA. So if you've, uh, when you buy your sunscreens, you've probably noticed when you buy sunscreen that um, a lot of sunscreen products now will tell you whether they're effective against UVA, UVB, UVC. Um, it's good information to know because you want as broad a spectrum of protection as possible when you're using a sunscreen. Um, even UVA rays can damage your skin, can lead to a premature aging of your skin. So um, it's ideal if you can get a broad spectrum and protection from all three. So as I said a few moments ago, UV radiation has been known for quite a while 
as a good disinfectant. Even in um, even centuries ago, we know that um, the healthcare professionals of the day understood that you could, for example, put blankets and linens out in the sun. And if you left them out there long enough, you could disinfect them. You could get rid of um, living things that might be growing in your, um, your bed linens and things like that. Um, we've known it for quite some time and we've made use of that knowledge um, in modern day by purposefully applying ultraviolet lights onto surfaces. It turns out that ultraviolet is a great disinfectant on smooth, hard surfaces. This is an important distinction right here. Ultraviolet has that one major drawback as a disinfectant, it doesn't penetrate very well. It can only penetrate to about two millimeters. So it's great on hard surfaces. What it's doing when it hits microbial cells that might be on those hard surfaces is it's damaging the DNA inside of those cells. And again, it can damage DNA in your cells too that are out on the outer surface of your body. So skin and cornea for us. Remember that uh, just as a little reminder from your anatomy and physiology, that it's that pigment called melanin that is inside your skin that can absorb ultraviolet radiation and give you some protection against its bad effects. Microbial cells don't have that. They don't have any melanin. And they are, if you remember, only about one or two micrometers in diameter. So ultraviolet will penetrate all the way through them. They are very, very vulnerable to ultraviolet exposure, microbial cells. Remember, there are two possible outcomes for a cell, whether it's your human cell or it's a microbial cell that gets exposed to ultraviolet radiation. The DNA can be damaged and that can impact the health of the cell or the cell can receive so much damage that it dies. I'm sure if any of you have ever experienced uh, a significant sunburn, you know uh, the, about the death of cells on your skin. So what exactly is ultraviolet light doing that damages our DNA? Remember, it's not ionizing. It's not knocking electrons out of orbit. It's doing something very specific to the DNA molecule. Remember inside your DNA, there are four bases, thymine, adenine, guanine, and cytosine, T, G, A, and C. It's the T, it's the thymine that gets damaged by ultraviolet. So where two thymine bases are located side by side in DNA, any place that they just happen to be side by side, for example, in this diagram, the four bases are colored yellow, blue, green, and red. Thymine is the yellow one. They're showing right here, there just happen to be two thymines sitting side by side right here where two thymine sit side by side, ultraviolet exposure causes them to bind to each other. And that creates a structure known as a thymine dimer. They're showing us this over here in this little drawing. They're showing us two thymines. Here's the sort of the backbone of the DNA molecule, this pink strand, and the bases jut off of that backbone. So here's a thymine base and here's another thymine base. They're gonna get hit with ultraviolet and they're gonna do this. They're gonna bind to each other, which is very abnormal. So the DNA is damaged anywhere that this happens.
now okay so the bases are stuck together i mean you know why does that matter i mean the dna is still there uh, what's the problem that the two thymines are stuck to each other well the problem comes in particularly when that dna has to be replicated remember when i use that word replication i'm talking about making a copy of the whole dna molecule so i'm not talking about the process called transcription where the dna is being used to make protein i'm talking about the time when the cell is about to replicate it's about to divide and it has to copy its dna there is an enzyme that does this work and as that enzyme travels down on each individual strand of the DNA molecule, it makes a new strand by pairing up the complementary bases. Remember that A binds with T and C binds with G in the two strands of DNA. So what the enzyme does is it takes the double helix shown here in green and it splits it into two individual strands. And then it travels along each strand and it places the appropriate complementary base. So I start with one green ladder, one green double helix, and I end up with two new double helices. And each one has an old strand and a new strand, old strand, new strand. That's how all living things copy their DNA. Here's the problem. When that enzyme comes to a thymine dimer, it doesn't know what to do with it. When the enzyme comes along and bumps into one of these dimers, it can't read them. It doesn't know what this is. So instead of seeing a T and saying, oh, well, I'm gonna put an A with this T, and then seeing another T and placing another A across from it. The enzyme comes along, sees the dimer and just puts any old base there. It just doesn't know what to do. So the enzyme often places an incorrect base at that location. Now, if that incorrect base pairing stays there, what has just happened is that DNA has been mutated. All a mutation is by definition is a change in the order of the base pairs in DNA. So when that happens and that enzyme puts the wrong base in or bases in, you've now got a mutation. The good news for you and I and other organisms is that we do have repair mechanisms in place. We have repair mechanisms in place to prevent this from happening. We have repair mechanisms that can come along and see this dimer and fix it. Some of these repair mechanisms literally cut the bond and just release the two thymines again. So, all living things have these repair systems in place. It's just that they differ a little bit between prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. That makes sense, right? We expect eukaryotic cells to just be functionally a little different from prokaryotic cells. UV radiation can be repaired. The, the damage caused by it can be repaired, but it's not always repaired. And if too much damage is done, if too much damage is done and the DNA molecule is so badly damaged that the repair systems can't fix it, then the cell's gonna die. And that's the same for your skin cells and for microbial cells. So a lot of what happens with UV exposure is the amount of exposure. As you and I know, you know, it's one thing to go out in the sun for 15 minutes, and it's another thing to go out in the sun for five hours. Same is true for microbial cells. They can take a little damage and they can repair it sometimes, but if they get too much damage, those cells can actually die. There are two primary systems in bacteria that we uh, need to know about. One is that photoreactivation or light repair. 
And this system gets its name because visible light actually turns this system on. So in other words, the bacteria have to be in the light, physically in the light for the enzymes that are gonna do this repair work to be activated. There are several, of, several different enzymes involved in this repair work, but we refer to them as photoliases. Remember, anytime you see A-S-E, think enzyme. So a photoliase is a type of enzyme that can split those thymine dimers, break them back apart and release the thymines and give the DNA molecule its normal structure again. Excision repair is different. It's a different system that's found in bacterial cells. This type of repair doesn't get activated by sunlight or by visible light, I should say. You don't have to have the cell be in the actual light for this repair system to work. This repair system will be active even in the dark. The type of enzymes that do this repair work are called endonucleases. And there are lots of these. This is another family of enzymes. What they're gonna do, instead of repairing um, the thymine dimer, instead of cutting this bond and um, letting these two thymines go back into their normal shape, it's just gonna remove it. It's gonna cut out cut out, that's where the excision term comes in. It's gonna cut these two thymines out of the DNA strand and replace them with normal thymines. So two different repair systems that have the same result. They're gonna fix those thymine dimers and prevent mutations from occurring. Now, it's important to note, as I said a minute ago, that these are biological systems and no biological system is 100% accurate. So yes, microbial cells have these two systems in place to fix ultraviolet damage, but not every cell is gonna be able to fix all of the damage that it gets from ultraviolet light. So yes, being exposed to ultraviolet light can mutate your DNA. We, we all know that because we know that exposure to sunlight can cause skin cancer. Yes, ultraviolet light can mutate your DNA, but it's not doing it directly. What it's doing is damaging your DNA. And then the natural process of DNA replication goes on and it can't occur normally because there's this big clumpy thymine dimer in there that can't be normally replicated. That's what leads to mutation. That's what leads to cancer. The damage that's done through a natural process of replication becomes a mutation over time. All right, so that's our sort of our background now about ultraviolet. Remember, microbial cells are very vulnerable because ultraviolet can penetrate to two millimeters and microbial cells are only micrometers in diameter. So ultraviolet goes straight through them. It's not ionizing, but it damages DNA. And if they get enough ultraviolet damage, the cell will die. So here's our experiment. Here's our purpose for our experiment today. We're gonna to expose bacterial cells to ultraviolet light. We have a special device called a UV box that we're gonna to use to expose bacterial cells to ultraviolet light for two different time periods. So this will be uh, an experiment in survival of the cell. How much ultraviolet does it take to actually kill 
a bacterial cell versus just damage its DNA. We're gonna expose cells for 30 seconds. We're gonna expose cells for 60 seconds. Now that may not seem like a lot of exposure, but remember these cells are fully penetrated by ultraviolet. So it doesn't take, uh, it doesn't take much to cause some significant damage. Now we're also gonna incubate these exposed plates. In other words, we're gonna spread these bacterial cells out onto agar plates and then expose them to ultraviolet. And then we're gonna put the plate right into the incubator. So they're gonna get their exposure and then they're gonna be allowed to grow if they can grow. They're gonna be allowed to grow overnight, 24 hour period. We're gonna incubate in two different conditions. Some of, the, some of the plates with exposed cells are gonna be exposed to light while they incubate. And some are gonna be kept in the dark. This step is all about those two repair systems. Any cell that's in an incubator with the lights on is gonna at least have an opportunity for that photoreactive repair to occur. Any cell that's incubating in the dark at least has the opportunity for that excision repair to occur. So we're gonna determine which repair systems uh, have what effects on these cells. Now, we're gonna be making a lot of plates for this experiment and I'll explain why in just a minute. But the other thing that we're doing today that we haven't done yet is we're gonna to try to grow lawns of bacteria. So if you remember, if you've had a chance to see the supplemental video I posted for you about colony morphology, right at the beginning of that video, I talk about how if you put enough cells onto an auger plate and spread them all out, you'll get what's called a lawn of bacteria growing. It's like one enormous, gigantic growth of bacterial cells. It's not a streak. It's not individual colonies. The whole surface will be covered in cells and that's called a lawn. So we're gonna try to grow lawns of bacteria um, under different conditions today. It allows us to see things a little more clearly. Now, the organisms that we're gonna to use today include one called Bacillus lichenoformis. That's a hard name right there. And the other one will be our old friend E. coli. Bacillus lichenoformis is a gram positive rod. It is not a pathogen. It lives in the soil and it's actually saprophytic. So remember, we talked about saprophytic fungi. <clears throat> we said that any fun fungus that is a saprophyte is one that will eat dead organisms. It'll eat dead organic matter. Well, there are some saprophytic bacteria as well, including this particular bacillus. It lives out in the soil and it helps degrade dead organisms. The E. coli, of course, is different. E. coli is a gram-negative rod. Remember, some strains of E. coli are pathogenic. Some strains are not. Some of them are quite helpful to us and live in our intestines, but some are pathogenic. Remember, E. coli is considered an enteric coliform. Remember, if you see the word enteric or the word coliform, we're talking about an organism that lives in the intestines, in the gastrointestinal system. Now, I included some images of these organisms just from quadrant streak plates, because this is a great example of how colony morphology can really differ from one organism to another. You can see that these are quadrant street plates, right? You can see there's a quadrant here and then there's one here 
and then there's one here, and then the fourth one is over here. So we dipped an inoculating loop into a broth tube that contained this organism, and we put a bunch of cells, we put that original loopful right here. And look at how much growth we got. Everywhere that you see that sort of cream colored material, those are bacterial cells. Then remember, we draw the loop, we clean off the loop first, and then we draw the loop through that mass of cells and we streak it out a second time. We're trying to get fewer and fewer and fewer cells with a quadrant streak because we wanna look at colonies. Then we pull through there and we streak. Then we pull through there and we streak. Here we are in the fourth quadrant. These are colonies. Look at this interesting organism. It grows as these very irregularly shaped colonies. Soil organisms are kind of weird. Soil bacteria are different from the bacteria that tends to grow in our bodies. Very strange looking, irregular colonies. Compare that to the E. coli plate. This is also a quadrant streak plate. We start off with a lot of cells and then we systematically get fewer and fewer and fewer until hopefully we get individual colonies. That's the whole purpose of making a quadrant streak plate. Look at these colonies, they're circular, they're much smaller than these are. They have the same color generally, both organisms, but the shape of the colony, the size of the colony, the margin or the edge of the colony is very different from organism to organism. Colony morphology is really helpful to us sometimes when we don't know what organism we're dealing with. All right, now this is where the experiment can be a little bit confusing. So be sure that you're um, jotting down the information you need to so that when you go back and look at this, it will make sense to you. We're using two organisms. We're gonna make four auger plates for each organism. Four plates for each organism because we're looking at two different variables today. We're looking at the effect of time and we're looking at the effect of incubating in the light or incubating in the dark. So we need four plates. Now, we're actually gonna take each one of those auger plates and we're gonna draw a line down the back of the plate with Sharpie to create uh, two sides, two halves. We're gonna spread our bacterial cells over the entire plate to try to, again, grow a lawn. But when we incubate the plates, uh, actually, even before that, when we expose them to the ultraviolet light, we're going to cover half of the plate. So one half of each plate is going to get exposed to ultraviolet light. The other half of each plate is going to be our control. We're just going to place a piece of paper over the plate, over that half of the plate, and that will stop the ultraviolet from getting to those cells. It's amazing, but that's all it takes. Just like if you go outside and you're wearing a tightly woven shirt, the ultraviolet can't get to your skin. It can't penetrate. So we're just gonna take a nice thick index card and we're gonna, we're gonna set it over half of each auger plate. So half of the plate, the cells get exposed, half of the plate, the cells don't get exposed. So there'll be a control on every plate that we make today. Why can't I just make one plate and make that be the control? Anybody have any ideas? Don't Why you need, oh, so, go ahead. <clears throat> well, don't you need to know that it can grow on the auger itself? Yeah, for each plate, I have to know that. For each plate, I have to check and double check that the cells are alive and able to grow. If you think about it, if I'm making multiple plates and I'm sticking a loop into a culture and I'm getting cells out and then I'm spreading them on a plate. Well, what if my loop was too hot for one of those? What if one time I had a hot loop and I killed all the cells that I took out of the tube and I spread dead cells on the plate? 
I have to know for each plate that the cells are alive and able to grow. So that's why I need that covered half. I need to protect half of the cells from ultraviolet exposure because those are going to be my controls. Those are going to be what tell me that, well, the cells were fine <laughs> on this side. So something must have happened to them on this side. And that something is ultraviolet exposure. Good. All right. So four plates for the bacillus lichenoformis, four plates for the E. coli. I'm spreading cells all over the plate, just like I'm making a spread plate, except I'm purposefully putting too many cells on those plates. I'm hoping to get a nice lawn of cells growing. The way I know I'm putting lots of cells on there is because I, I can control the density of cells in any culture. And I'm gonna monitor to make sure that I have a nice uh, thick, heavy culture of bacillus and I have a nice heavy culture of E. coli. Four plates for each organism. Here's how we're gonna treat them. Remember, we have two variables. So uh, two of the plates will get exposed to the light, uh, to ultraviolet light for 30 seconds. One of those plates goes into the light to incubate one goes into the dark to incubate. Two, the other two plates will get exposed to ultraviolet for 60 seconds. One will go into the light to incubate, one will go into the dark to incubate. All right, let's take a look at some results. Oh, before I do that, I did wanna show you this device if you've never seen one. We use ultraviolet a lot in the lab because we know that it's possible to mutate or to cause mutations with ultraviolet light. Remember the ultraviolet doesn't directly mutate the DNA, it damages the DNA. But if we damage cells and then we allow them to grow and divide, we'll induce mutations. So uh, we use that sometimes in the lab to purposefully create mutations. So this is the device, it's called an ultraviolet box. <clears throat> it's heavy black metal. This is the lamp right here that's creating or emitting the ultraviolet radiation. And you can see there's a little place for you to look into the box. Um, this is the eyepiece right here. You have to put on uh, safety goggles, of course. Um, anytime you look at ultraviolet light, you need protection for your eyes. And there's a film across this light viewing area um, that protects your eyes from the ultraviolet light. Here's one of our dishes right here. The cells have been spread on it. I'm gonna place an index card over half of that plate. I'm gonna put the plate in the box. I'm gonna set an index card over half of the plate. And then I'm gonna turn the light on for 30 seconds or for 60 seconds, depending on the plate. All right, here's our results. So on this, um, on this slide, what you're looking at over here on the right, this is the bacillus lichenoformis organism incubated in the light, incubated in the dark. This is the E. coli incubated in the light, incubated in the dark. These plates were exposed to ultraviolet for 30 seconds. Okay, so let's review how we made these plates. I took the, the bacillus culture. I took a, lo a loop full of cells out using my best aseptic technique. I put those cells onto the plate and then I used a hockey stick to spread them out all over the surface of the plate. Right, make sense? Because I'm, it's it's the same way I would make us any other spread plate. So I've got cells on that plate, but they haven't incubated yet. I'm going to take that plate. I'm going to put it in the UV box, and I'm going to cover half of it with my index card. Now I'm going to turn the light source on for 30 seconds. I'm going to take the plate out 
flip it upside down, of course, and I'm going to incubate it for 24 hours. Remember, for each organism, one of those plates got incubated in the light and one got incubated in the dark after 30 seconds of exposure. So let's take a look at these. Let me enlarge these so we can see them. The most notable thing was that it didn't matter whether they got incubated in the light or the dark. And that's what I've written down here. There was no difference in growth pattern from the light and the dark. In other words, both repair systems worked equally well or equally poorly, as we'll see in a minute. There was no difference in what we saw in terms of an effect from 30 seconds of exposure, whether the plate was incubated in the light and had some light repair done, or if it was incubated in the dark and had some dark repair done. Now, full, uh, full disclosure here, if you look close enough, these are identical plates. <laughs> these aren't two separate plates. These are the exact same plates. Um, just because these images came out better than some other images I had. I just want to drive home the point that whether the plate came out of the light or the dark, that didn't matter with this 30 seconds of exposure. So I'm just going to minimize one of these pictures for each one. So here's what's important. Take a look at the Bacillus lichenoformis plate. This side of the plate got covered by the index card. This is my control. Look at that. I got a nice thick lawn of cells to grow on this plate. I covered the entire surface of the agar with cells growing. On this side, I got individual colonies growing, didn't I? I can see a bunch of individual colonies on here. So lots and lots and lots of cells over here, many fewer cells over here. Still cells though, there's still growth over here. There's still growth after 30 seconds of ultraviolet exposure. It's just that there's much less growth. I got individual colonies to grow from the cells that are alive but I didn't get as many cells to grow as I did over here. Some cells on the exposed side died after 30 seconds of exposure. Some of them survived. They were repaired and they survived. Some of them couldn't be repaired and they died. Does that make sense? If the ultraviolet light had not killed any cells, I should have seen a lawn on that side. But if the ultraviolet had killed all the cells, I shouldn't have seen any growth at all. So the fact that I saw colonies on that other side of the plate tells me that there were cells that were still alive on that plate after UV exposure. And overnight, those cells divided and grew into colonies. Now, the only way that could have happened is if the damage that those cells got was repaired. They got exposed, the whole group of those cells got exposed to ultraviolet light some of them had a little bit of damage to their DNA. Some of them had a lot of damage to their DNA, but there was damage. Some of the cells just died. The repair mechanisms, they couldn't save those cells. So anywhere a cell died, there's just a blank place on the auger now. But if the cell was successfully repaired, overnight it could grow into a colony. And that's why I'm able to see some colonies on this plate. So remember, we had one plate look like this with colonies that had been incubated in the light. 
So that tells me that what helped save some of these cells, what helped repair and save some of these cells was light repair. I had another plate that was incubated in the dark and looked a lot like this. Some cells died, some cells were repaired. And if it was incubated in the dark, the repair system would have been the excision system. Some cells got repaired, they survived and they grew into colonies. Now, the same thing happened on the E. coli plates. I got a nice lawn of growth on the control side. Oh, you can still see where it says light and dark. Just try to ignore those terms. I got a nice lawn of growth on the side that was covered with the index card because those cells didn't even get exposed to UV. They got spread out on the plate, they grew overnight. I got a nice lawn. Over on this side, most of the cells were killed by 30 seconds of ultraviolet exposure. Look, I've only got one, two, three, maybe four or five colonies on this plate. I've got maybe hundreds of colonies on this plate. So, these, there was a cell that landed right here on the plate that survived and grew into a colony overnight. There was a cell right here on the plate that survived and grew into a colony and here and here. So many fewer cells survived 30 seconds of UV exposure, but some of them did. And because I got this similar result in both the light and the dark incubation conditions, it tells me that both systems were at work. It's just that these cells were just more vulnerable than these cells were. Now, why is that? Well, these are two different organisms, right? This is an organism that lives in the soil. This is an organism that very well gets exposed to ultraviolet all the time. And it has evolved to have better, more efficient repair systems. This is a cell, an organism, this E. coli, that never sees sunlight, right? It lives in our intestines. So its repair systems have not evolved to work as well as this organisms do. So it, they do work. They, we got a couple cells saved, repaired and saved but most of the cells on the E. coli plate died. Even after just 30 seconds of exposure, those cells were so badly damaged and the repair systems were so inefficient that most of the cells died. It's easy for us sometimes to forget that different species of bacteria are different organisms. It's like comparing um, a palm tree to an oak tree or on the animal side, comparing um, a mouse to a giraffe. They're different organisms and they have evolved differently. So yes, all bacteria have DNA repair systems but some bacteria have more efficient, more effective DNA repair than other organisms do. You can see something um, similar evolutionarily in humans, right? Remember we said the melanin that's in our skin can absorb ultraviolet light and protect our cells from being damaged. Well, people who are of African descent have evolved to have much more melanin in their skin than people like me who are very pale from you know, Northern U European descent. I am just more susceptible to damage from DNA, uh, from uh, ultraviolet exposure than someone who has African descent because we're two different organisms. We're both human, but we're two different types of humans. And just as there are different types of humans, there are different types of bacteria as well. You can really see it when you compare these two organisms. That bacillus organism has a much better 
much more effective light repair system and dark repair system than that poor little E. coli does. The E. coli still has light repair and it still has dark repair. It just doesn't work as well. So these are our 30 second results. Now let's look at our 60 second results. This is like the difference in probably, you know, uh, the difference between a, a day of exposure for us in the sun and a year of exposure in the sun. Just like last time, we didn't see any difference in the light versus the dark incubation, but we certainly saw a difference in terms of surviving cells. Check this out, 60 seconds of exposure. Here's the bacillus lichenoformis plate. Here's the E. coli plate. If you look down here, <laughs> there is one colony growing on the side that got exposed for 60 seconds to UV light. So we saw one or maybe two colonies on the plate that was incubated in the light and the plate that was incubated in the dark almost all of the cells were just outright killed after 60 seconds of exposure. E. coli, none, no colonies, all the cells died. So 60 seconds of exposure was enough, even in bacillus lichenoformis, to just kill all the cells outright. It's an impressive um, comparison because it really drives home this idea that the amount of ultraviolet exposure that cells get exposed to really matters. And that goes for us as well as bacteria. Could I ask a practical application question? Yeah, I'm gonna so, do that in just a minute too. I'm gonna to ask oh, some practical questions, but go yeah. ahead. So mine is about E. coli. Yeah. Um, and the frequent problems that there are with greens, um, packaged greens. Um, would UV radiation damage the delicate cells of those greens and that's not why they irradiate yeah. spinach? It's a great question. So um, you're referring to, if, if you're not familiar, there have been multiple instances in recent years of recalls of fresh greens because of E. coli contamination. And this E. coli, believe it or not, um, the, the pathogenic strain um, of E. coli that causes this problem for us, the way it gets on these greens, not to be too disgusting, but it often has to do with the lack of sanitary facilities in, um, in, on farms across our country. So a lot of uh, migrant workers uh, harvest our vegetables, our fruits and vegetables. These people are working 15 hours a day. They are oftentimes not provided with any sanitary facilities. So they relieve themselves out in the field. And they also have nowhere to wash their hands after they go to the bathroom. So it's not surprising that a human pathogen gets on our veggies. And like you just pointed out, a lot of times people, uh, our veggies are so delicate, our greens are so delicate, people don't wanna be rough with them and you know, use soap and water on them, right? A lot of people bring them home and just eat them. And that's how these outbreaks get started. So that's a really good question. Like, is it a good idea to maybe use ultraviolet on greens? And the answer is yes, and we do. <laughs> um, oh, there goes my million dollar idea. <laughs> <laughs> so here's my question for you though. Um, let's say you work in a restaurant. Let's say you own a restaurant and you buy lovely fresh greens each day for your customers and you're concerned about E. coli. You don't want anybody that eats at your restaurant to get sick from eating a salad. So you decide to install some ultraviolet lights over your work surfaces where you're gonna make your salads. Are you gonna feel good about a 30 second exposure? Or are you gonna want a 60 second exposure? What do you think? 
Um, I would like the 60 second, please. Yeah, yeah. Or even longer, right? Here's the thing about those greens. You can absolutely damage uh, leafy greens with um, harsher disinfectants, like chemical disinfectants, like soaps. You can damage leafy greens by trying to wash them with soaps. You can do it. And a lot of people do, I do. I tend to um, dunk my salads into a soap solution before I eat them. But um, people, a lot of people would prefer a less damaging process and ultraviolet is a good way to go. You have to spread everything out though on the work surface. It doesn't penetrate very well, right? So you gotta make sure that if you're gonna use it, you have to spread your materials out and let the ultraviolet penetrate that little tiny distance. Um, but yeah, people do use ultraviolet. Um, of course, washing at the site that they're harvested would also be a really good idea. And a lot of um, manufacturers now do that. Um, if you pick up some of these prepackaged containers of greens now, it'll say right on the package that they've been triple washed on the farm. Because the idea is let's get the cell, any microbial cells off before we even send it to the grocery store. Um, but obviously if you're buying, you know, a nice big head of romaine lettuce that's not in a plastic package, um, you have to be aware of these things. You have to be aware of the potential microbes. And um, yeah, some restaurants particularly like to use ultraviolet um, to help prevent that kind of food poisoning from occurring. Good question. So I've got a couple slides here that are just to sort of conclude for us today. What effects did the 30 seconds of ultraviolet have on this bacillus lichenoformis organism? 30 second plates. The question is, did it kill all the cells? Not all of them, but some of them. Yeah. Remember, this is the plate that got exposed for 30 seconds. And we had two, we had one that looked sort of like this that had incubated in the light and one that looked sort of like this that incubated in the dark. So we definitely had cell death, but we didn't kill all the cells, not nearly so. We still got hundreds, tens, or maybe hundreds of colonies growing on this plate, but many fewer cells than what we got for the control. So no. Some colonies go, were present. Some colonies were present on both of those plates, light and dark. Was DNA damage repaired in those cells? And how do you know? For the Bacillus lichenoformis that got exposed to 30 seconds, do we have evidence that some of the DNA damage from this UV exposure was repaired. Is there repair going on over here? Yes. Yes, why? How do you know? Oh, uh, well, because um, those cells survived and, and mu multiplied overnight when it was right. incubating. Exactly, they didn't just survive, they multiplied. They multiplied, they replicated again um, creating these colonies. Remember what a colony is. It's a parent cell that has divided over and over and over and over again, over a 24 hour period. And it's created a colony. It's created a, a, a little pile of cloned bacterial cells. So in order to do that, in order for it to not only survive, but replicate its DNA must have been repaired. And because this looked similar in both the light and the dark, we know that both systems were active. It's a good reminder though, that even when these repair systems work very well, and they do in this bacillus organism, every cell is not gonna get saved. Every cell is not gonna be repaired. Some of these cells are gonna die outright, some of these cells are gonna survive, but they're so badly damaged that um, you're gonna have mutations in them and they're, um, they're, they're dangerous cells. They're um, unhealthy, dangerous cells. They're not gonna be able to divide and grow normally. 
And then here's my question from a moment ago. Would you disinfect a stainless steel workspace in a restaurant with 30 seconds of ultraviolet light? And hopefully your answer is no, because I don't want any microbes to survive. If I'm trying to disinfect my workplace in a restaurant, I don't want this. <laughs> I want this. I want to kill them all. So I would never use 30 seconds now that I can now that I know that so many cells, fewer on this plate than this plate, but lots of different uh, cells survived. They got repaired, they divided, they created colonies. I want to see this. I want to kill them all. So no, I would never use 30 seconds of exposure. I would want a longer exposure time. So again, these are the four plates. Now, yes, these two plates are, are actually the same plate, but it just for demonstration purposes, we saw a similar growth pattern in the bacillus plates from the light and the dark incubation and in the E. coli plates in the light and the dark. Many, many more cells survived in the B, uh, B. lichenoformis experiment than in the E. coli experiment. Cells survived, so there was some repair going on here. It's just that the repair didn't work nearly as well for E. coli as it did for bacillus. Bacillus has evolved to have very effective, efficient repair systems. And if you think about it, that makes sense because bacillus has to deal with ultraviolet light. It lives in the soil. It, it, in order for it to survive as an organism, it has had to evolve to a point where at least um, some cells could be repaired enough to grow and, and live normally. E. coli, it's got the repair systems in place, but they're not working nearly as well. And that makes sense. E. coli doesn't deal with ultraviolet light in its everyday life. So yes, it has repair systems. We can see that evidence here, but the repair system is not nearly as effective as it is for Bacillus lichenoformis. And of course, for you and I, and anybody that's trying to control E. coli contamination in food, especially, that's good news. The repair systems in E. coli are just not that great. So ultraviolet works pretty well when you could want to control E. coli. It's just that you got to use it for a long enough period. And like any time you use ultraviolet as a disinfectant, you have to make sure that the material is a thin layer that you're trying to disinfect. <laughs> you don't want to put, you know, a bowl, a deep bowl of spinach leaves under an ultraviolet light because you're going to disinfect that top, the top leaves in that pile, but you're not going to disinfect what's down at the bottom. Ultraviolet can't do that. It can't in, penetrate. In our lecture, it showed ultraviolet lights in restaurant kitchens. Yeah. And it said that it causes damage to the skin. So you need to be careful with your employees. Yeah. You have to be very careful. No, if here's it's not, if a it's lot not of, that close. A lot of, um, it's, it's not about the closeness of the light to the skin. It's about the, um, the strength of the bulb, if that makes sense. So you can buy these bulbs that generate ultraviolet light and some will um, emit more ultraviolet radiation than others will, but it's all dangerous to us. So we have to be careful. Now, some restaurants, and this is what was shown in lecture, some restaurants use ultraviolet as a general disinfectant. So they're not trying to disinfect food they're trying to disinfect the kitchen, okay? So they're gonna have ultraviolet lights positioned in the kitchen on the ceilings and on the doorways and things so that surfaces can be exposed and disinfected. 
But here's the thing that I mentioned in lecture, you wouldn't want those lights running all day because you have people in the kitchen all day. So those people would also be exposed to that ultraviolet light. So what a lot of restaurants do is they turn those ultraviolet units on at night when they close and the kitchen gets bathed in ultraviolet light so that all of those stainless steel chopping stations and the sink and the area around the sink gets hit with ultraviolet light and any pathogens that might be you know, hiding in the dark corners in the kitchen will hopefully be killed. So that was more about, um, that um, part of the lecture was more about when ultraviolet is used to disinfect um, the room. When you're trying to disinfect food, it's a little bit different because you can apply ultraviolet light a lot more carefully and more directly with food. Um, if you're trying to disinfect the room, it's a little trickier. But yeah, a lot of places turn those lights on after everybody goes home. Now, I will also say that I've been in restaurants where I've noticed that there are ultraviolet lights on all day, but they put them in very strategic places. They tend to put them in the places where the issues around contamination are most problematic. But still, I don't think it's good practice to have your employees exposed to ultraviolet light while they're in the workplace. It's just not safe. It's not safe for their eyes and it's not safe for the skin. Um, the other thing I talk about a lot is um, how, um, I'll, I'll tell you this and then I'll let you go. Um, this, I, I believe I talk about this in the lecture. Um, you see a lot of advertisements now for ultraviolet tools that people can buy, like individuals can buy. And the, the gimmick is that you can disinfect your world. You know, you can be so safe and you can protect yourself from pathogens. And, um, and you buy these expensive little wands that emit ultraviolet light. First of all, super dangerous because if people don't understand and they don't protect themselves, you know, you can just see people staring at the ultraviolet light. But anyway, um, I, I love it when I see these advertisements that show somebody, you know, waving an ultraviolet wand over a mattress and saying, you know, this is how you can disinfect your mattress. It's like, no, no, you can't. You can disinfect the first two millimeters of your mattress with an ultraviolet light, but you can't disinfect a mattress with an ultraviolet light because it cannot penetrate through the mattress. Um, so it's really buyer beware. Um, you, you have to know a little bit about how these things work um, before you spend money on them. Yeah, I've seen, especially during the pandemic, I've seen so many advertisements for ultraviolet devices that are intended for people to use in their home. And um, no mention of the fact that they really only work on hard, smooth, surfaces like workspaces like uh, prep kitchen tables and things like that they work great for those but no they won't disinfect your mattress do they disinfect against um other things like viruses so the the tricky thing about viruses i'm glad you asked that because you know again pandemic stuff COVID, right? yeah <laughs> the tricky thing about the viruses is viruses are not alive right Viruses are particles, but they do have genetic material in them, right? They, they have genetic material. So you would think, oh, ultraviolet would be great, right? For some viral particles, you can damage the DNA and it's great, it works great against viruses, but the virus has to have DNA in it. Think about the COVID virus for a minute. The COVID virus doesn't uh -huh. have DNA. Yeah. And the difference between DNA and RNA is that RNA doesn't have thymine in it. Oh my gosh. How about that? I know. Now, it is true that anything, anything, this shirt, if I left it in ultraviolet light for a long, 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 long time, it would start to degrade. It would ruin it. 
think about, um, you know, if you leave uh, cushions on your patio furniture in the sunlight all summer, they often fade, right? The ultraviolet light can also destroy materials. And the truth is ultraviolet can just degrade viral particles over time, but they have to be exposed for a long time. The much better disinfectant for viruses, especially if you don't know if they're DNA or RNA based, is chemicals. The much, much better disinfectant is alcohol or bleach. That's a great question. People have been so interested in learning how to disinfect things this, during this horrible pandemic. And um, there's so much you know, information and misinformation out there. Um, it's been very hard for people to understand um, what's effective and what's not. My, one of my sisters in the early days of the pandemic, if she got a package, she was leaving the package outside sometimes for a day before she brought it in. And she told me that her thinking was that the sun would destroy any virus that was on the cardboard. And I said, I love that. I love that you're thinking about ultraviolet light, but no, it's not gonna work. Um, the good news, as we all have heard now, is that this virus doesn't survive well on cardboard. It doesn't last. It tends to fall apart on cardboard pretty quickly. So, um, so her boxes were actually quite safe for her to open right away. But um, you can see where people would think, oh, I'll just leave everything in the sun and that'll work. That'll disinfect. For a lot of things it does. For bacteria, it works great. But... Um, but yeah, not necessarily for viruses. Good questions. All right, I think that's just about, I just wanna double check and make sure there wasn't anything else in here I wanted to talk about. Oh yeah, just a reminder to us that when we get together next time, we're gonna talk some more about disinfection, but we're gonna leave ultraviolet behind and we're gonna talk about chemicals. Um, and um, some other means of disinfecting, including another physical method, which is heat. Heat is another great disinfectant. All right. Any other questions or comments? All right, very good. So the next time you're, um, when the world comes back to normal and the next time you're out in a restaurant or maybe uh, in a doctor's office or a hospital, look around for the ultraviolet lights because they're there. Um, they're all over the place. Um, and they're there because they're good disinfectants for solid surfaces. <laughs> all right, everybody, I'm gonna let you go. I'll see you on Wednesday. Thanks so much. Have Thank you. Evening.